does the evidence seem to point towards the cave as being where this virus originated from? Um, and that that she then generated SARS-2 from something she found in that cave? Yes. Um, un under the lab escape hypothesis, we have no, well, we have no evidence anyway that SARS-2 was ever inside a bat. In other words, it could be a totally artificial virus. Now, if it is a totally artificial virus, the way it would have been created is uh, just the way we see from her previous published experiments with uh, Ralph Barak. She would have taken the backbone of one coronavirus and she would have inserted into it the spike proteins uh, from various other coronaviruses. So the spike proteins are very important because they, they define what kind of host the virus will attack. And so one of these, one of these viruses she, she had created, they probably all used the backbones from the, from the, 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 the cave we discussed. Um, and, and she would have spliced different spike protein genes into them and one of them probably, or very possibly, was the SARS-2 virus. How common are lab escapes? How, how common do viruses get out of labs? They are much more common than we realize. Uh, yeah, they're kind of horrifyingly um, common. There's about one, one or two escapes a, a year that we know of, and maybe others that don't get reported. Um, so even the smallpox virus um, which is one of the most deadly pathogens you can think of escaped from labs in England uh, in the in the 1970s. More recently, the SARS-1 virus, um, that's in 2003, um, escaped four times from the Beijing Institute of Virology. Um, it's a it's a real hard virus to right. contain. I should be asking you what hasn't escaped then. The, uh, the yes. Wuhan Institute of Virology, it says, has a new BSL4 lab which I understand that's that's like the, one of the top security labs in terms of locking down virus, but its state of readiness considerably alarmed the State Department inspectors who visited it from the Beijing embassy in 2018. Um, it didn't have appropriately trained technicians uh, and investigators to operate a high containment laboratory. And as a result, probably a lot of scientists in China didn't want to work in that lab because it's also very uncomfortable to work in those uh, in how would you describe it in you know you the full suit very restrictive uncomfortable physically uncomfortable labs oh, right virologists really don't like working in 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 bsl4 um, conditions and uh, and uh, as you say the 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 people the state department guys who inspected the wuhan institute of virology bs4 lab found lots of deficiencies however in a way that's all beside the point because Dr. Xi did not do any of her work in BSL-4 conditions. Uh, they were all done in, in, in BSL-2 and 3. So uh, BSL-2 is, is really almost nothing. It's very, very minimal safety conditions. Basically, you put up a sign saying biohazard, and, and you try and remember not to suck up fr fluids through a pipette, as virologists like to do. That's it. it, it it's, it's hard to, it, it's the level of a, of a dentist's waiting office uh, 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 in one description. You're kidding me. Not a waiting office. It's just a dentist's office in the US will follow BSL-2 safety guidelines. I'm told that there were people who worked uh, in that lab that got ill uh, just before the COVID-19 outbreak was announced by the Chinese government. Is that right? Well, this yeah, this comes from the intelligence uh, side. So, so the, uh, the U.S. intelligence uh, uh, agencies say they have in, uh, in intelligence information. Believable. In September 2019, three people at the Wuhan Institute of Virology became very seriously ill, with some kind of respiratory disease. Now, it looks like it was COVID-19. But it, it could all, it could also have been very severe in influenza. They favor COVID, which leads other epidemiologists and experts to say that probably the outbreak of COVID was much earlier than the Chinese announced. And I know that's been a moving target, but but mostly in December, correct? 
Um, that's right. I mean, there's no reason it shouldn't have uh, come earlier, and uh, and September sort of seems a, a reasonable date. I also read it in this letter uh, that has now been publicly put out by scientists calling for a new investigation by the World Health Organization, um, that they staff tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies at the Wuhan Institute in March 2020. Uh, yet statistically, um, roughly less than one chance in a billion, given that there's more than 590 staff and students at the Institute, and about 4.4% of the Wuhan urban population tested positive around that time, even if only 85 people were tested, the chance of a no positive test result would be less than 4%. So, right. <laughs> the Chinese got too clever there. Yeah, that really calls into question as to as to what the Chinese government was coming clean on and, and, and what it wasn't. The other, look, the other part of the puzzle that you, you lay out very well is that one of the explanations from the very beginning was that you can tell through gene splicing, I believe, that if anybody's been messing around with a virus or creating a virus and that that didn't show up here, but the science of that uh, was probably misstated and that there are many ways that you could you could play or engineer a virus uh, without the, the old ways of, of understanding clearly that that had been done. So you can probably put that a little more concisely than I can. Well, you said it very, very well. And this was a, a letter in the, of the journal Nature Medicine, which was very influential because it was a group of quite well-known virologists saying it is clear that the virus was not been manipulated, but no one, no one could tell that uh, because as you mentioned, the way, the way you in fact manipulate those viruses today is not in the old way, which did leave telltale tell marks. It's in uh, uh, various other ways, which don't leave any marks. In fact, you know, the best way to get a virus to attack uh, a, a human cells, you take it from an animal and you, you get it to infect say humanized mice. And, and most of the time, the viruses can't do it, they all die, but you know, to one in a billion will have a sort of lucky mutation that lets it sort of mildly infect humanized mice. So then you take the progeny of that virus and you put them again into mice. It's it's called um, serial passage. Forgive me while I close phone. It's called serial passage. Serial passage. So you you just keep moving the virus from from one culture uh, or, 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 or animals to the next. And what you end up with is, is a virus very well adapted to attack human cells. And, and what's happened is that a natural selection has done all the heavy lifting. And there's no way by just by looking at that virus that you can tell whether that happened through natural evolution in the wild or through a, vir a virologist just doing serial passage in a lab. So this very influential letter in Nature Medicine was assuring the public of something that the writers could not possibly know. Could it have been a bioweapon? I, 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 didn't, I didn't think so. There's no, there's no evidence of, of that. I mean, what is, what is possible, uh, and we certainly don't know this for sure, is that there was some, some uh, military biology efforts going on in the background and and very very possibly they were directed toward creating a vaccine against coronaviruses and this is not particularly sinister i think it's what our military would do if if uh, if they found some quite dangerous virus that was sort of at large in the population in fact they, they, would, in fact, they, they are walk. doing it and do it routinely they, they yeah so they it's try still, to get ahead of these viruses for soldiers because apparently in the spanish flu there were more soldiers killed by the Spanish flu than, than, uh, than the war at the time. Yeah, of course, you need to protect your own, yeah. your own forces. So I don't see, uh, you know, if, if there were military involvement, you yeah. know, I don't see any particular scandal there. Something else you mentioned, hospitals receiving the early patients are clustered around the Wuhan number two subway line, which connects the Institute of Virology at one end with the international airport at the other. Right. Uh, is that <laughs> a pretty critical piece of evidence here? Uh, well, it's a very interesting uh, 
uh, finding, uh, it needs to be confirmed because uh, I think it hasn't, it hasn't been published in a, in a journal yet. Uh, that but was by Stephen Quay, a, a physician researcher who's applied statistical and bioinformatic tools to uh, ingenious explorations of the vi virus's origin. Yes, very ingenious. I mean, he looked at all the hospitals in Wuhan to which the first patients were taken, and he found that all the hospitals were near subway stops on the, on the number two subway line in Wuhan, which is interesting because at one end of it is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and at the other end is the International Airport. So if lab workers at the Institute had got infected and were commuting on the number two subway line, this is sort of perfect conveyor belt for distributing the virus to the rest of the world, which of course is just what happened. There are so many people reading your essay and so many people um, who are calling for further investigations by the World Health Organization. Um, because I think now there is beginning to be, and I should be careful how I characterize it, is there a consensus? I don't know. But there is certainly a large number of former defense, biological experts, the scientific community, uh, analysts like yourself who really think that all roads lead to the Wuhan lab. I'll ask you the, the obvious, why is it important now that we really understand where COVID-19 originated and whether it did indeed come from gain of function experiments in that lab? Uh, well, I think we re really need to know but because of the policies uh, 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 that would uh, follow from the two possibilities. I mean, if it came from the lab, we need to you know, make sure we take a very hard look at gain of function experiments all around the world. Not which just were banned, which were banned in the United States at a certain point, right? And then the another administra presidential administration came in and then allowed them to take place again. And gain of function are done in parts of Europe, just not only Asia. Well, right, they were under a US uh, moratorium from 2014 to 2017. Yes. And, and it's a very interesting question, maybe a whole other story as to why the US government continues to fund the, the work at the Wuhan Institute of Virology throughout this moratorium and thereafter. But in, in any case, if, if, if the virus really did escape from the lab, then we need to take a very hard look at all gain and function experiments. If it did not escape from the lab, if it came from natural emergence, then we need to redouble our efforts to find the sources of these viruses. What do you think we're left here with the Chinese government? They're not going to supply all the records in the lab. They're not allowing even journalists to go to the, the cave to investigate the origins of this. Um, without a, without a, a, a coming clean, uh, because they don't want to accept responsibility for sparking a pandemic, um, the, the World Health Organization is discredited to some degree in its initial investigation. Um, are we ever going to get to the bottom of this? Or do you think we're kind of there now? I think we're at one bottom right now, which is we probably got all the information, all the scientific information we're going to get until um, or unless the, the, the Chinese, as you say, come clean. But I think that, that there's a very interesting fallback position you can envisage for them, which is to say, OK, we did have an accident in our lab, just like you do in the West and every place else. But look, who funded this research? It was the American government. Um, so it's just our bad luck that the accident took place on our soil. It's really a sort of a, a global problem. I think, I think they might sort of play, you can imagine them playing that card if there's a sufficient storm of protest in the West, if their cover-up story falls apart, if people start to sort of see the obvious that, 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 that it's much more probable the virus came from their lab. If you put enough pressure on them, I think you might sort of generate internal pressures in China because they, you know, their scientists are just like ours. Some of, some of them are honest and would like the truth to come out. You might generate the pressure in which the, this fallback position becomes preferable from them. And then of course, everyone would be much further ahead. It would just establish a degree of trust between China and the West and we could all start on a new leaf if that isn't too panglossy. However, it's not going to happen soon, that's for sure. Certainly more plausible than the frozen food imported uh, suggestion that they've, they've been floating. Whatever spin doctor spun that needs a new job. But look, Nicholas, thank you so much. Uh, um, great piece. 
and amazing research. And we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for your interest.